Good morning, beekeepers. Morning, morning, morning. You guys want to get started on this thing? Okay, my name's Donald Weissel. I've been elected slash drafted to be our master of ceremonies today. Um, I want to welcome you all to the first of hopefully many four states bee conferences. Uh, this whole idea kind of started uh, one day when uh, Dale Foley and I were just chit-chatting about what to do for a club thing. And we decided, wouldn't it be great to get Randy Oliver to come? And then we thought, let's get the other clubs involved too. Well, then we needed a place to do this. And we got in touch with Dr. Katie Gilman, and she really made all of this happen. Yes. The uh, venue and coordinating everything, and she did a really great job with that. Um, I'd like to ask everybody to please silence your cell phones. Um, we are being recorded for posterity. We've got a little camera set up back there, so um, uh, just be, be mindful about tripping on the uh, tripod back there. You need to use a restroom. You go straight out the door if they're down the hallway and on the right. Um, so with all of that said, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Katie Kilmer. She's a faculty member here at Missouri Southern State University. She teaches the pollinator class. She's the faculty advisor for the pollinator club here, and she's done a lot of great education for us at our bee club. And she's going to talk about pesticides today. I'm going to go with the mic because I like to roam around and I'm short, so if I stand here, none of you guys are going to be able to see me. I'm just going to wonder where the voice is coming from. So, um, as I mentioned, there are bathrooms down the hall that way. There are also bathrooms that way, so if you wander around long enough, you're guaranteed to find one somewhere in the building and get to see some of the beautiful campus right now. You may get out of the building, you've gone too far, so you should turn around and come back into the building. Today I'm going to be doing a talk on pesticides, on how they affect our pollinator species, and then some of the environmental policies that relate to pesticides. So it's going to touch a little bit across the board. It's going to be a little more jargony, scientific -y, so I'm trying to break it down, but feel free to ask questions if you have them. I am not an expert in the field of pesticides, so it's stuff I've, I've taken classes on, I've taught some stuff on, but this is not what I've done years and years and years of study on. So there may be times if you have a question where I say I'm not sure of the answer to that, I don't want you to think I just don't want to answer your question. I just don't want to lie to you and tell you something that's not true. So today we're going to talk about some pesticides and policies. So we're going to start off with a story. This is from a book some of you guys might have read, but it's called A Fable for Tomorrow. It said there once was a town in the heart of America where all life seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings. The town lay in the midst of a checkerboard of prosperous farms with fields of grain and hillsides of orchards, where in spring white clouds of bloom drifted above the green fields. And along the roads, laurel, viburnum, and alder, great ferns and wildflowers delighted the traveler's eye through much of the year. It sounds like a place we'd all love to go and visit. Unfortunately, this picture is from Germany and not America because I couldn't find a great picture from America, but it paints a good picture of what we're talking about. So beautiful fields, blooming wildflowers, everything we love. But if you keep reading the story, it tends to take a turn after that. So the next paragraph says, Then a strange blight kept, crept over the area, and everything began to change. There was a strange stillness. The birds, for example, where had they gone? The apple trees were coming into bloom, but no bees droned among the blossoms, so there was no pollination, and there would be no fruit. This was from Silent Spring, written by Rachel Carson in 1962, and she was describing what she saw as a potential future if pesticides kept being used the way they were at the time. So at the time, things were used fairly indiscriminately. We we're broadcasting mass amounts of pesticides with little understanding of the long-term effects of them. So she said this is what she was kind of predicting would happen in the future. This is before we had any kind of colony collapse. This is before we started having all the invasive pests. But she did a pretty good job of predicting what she thought the outcome might be like. So Silent Spring was the first book that really started waking up the American public to possible environmental concerns. It brought the, this issue to the vast majority of the American public. <clears throat> it actually received a lot of pushback at the time that it was published because her training was as a marine biologist, not as anything to do with pesticide 
uh, pesticide regulation or pesticide science, but she identified this problem. So this was recently, I say recently, but 2006, we're already well over a decade ago. This was named one of the 25 greatest science books of all time. I will say if you haven't read it, I recommend it, but it is tough because everything that's in there sounds exactly like what's happening right now as well. So it seems like we haven't come that far. But what this book did was introduce readers to the potential dangers of using pesticides without full knowledge of their effects, both on humans and on animals. It's important to note in this book, Rachel Carson was not saying that we should not use pesticides. She recognized that pesticides are an integral part of our agricultural system. But you cannot maintain the crop yields you have, that occasionally there are pest species that we do need to account for in terms of human health. But, she said, we need to understand exactly what it is we're using. We need to use them wisely and we need to use them in moderation. So a lot of people think that Rachel Carson wanted to get rid of all pesticides, and she never said that. She just said, we need to know what we're doing. So today, I'm going to start by talking to you about what a pesticide is, what our major types of pesticides are. We'll talk about how they actually work on insects and how they could potentially work on humans. Some of our major policies that regard pesticides historically and modern day. And then we'll talk about some current pesticide issues. And I did need to say, I have a little cough, so I apologize. I'll try not to cough directly into the microphone. So to start off, what's a pesticide? A pesticide is any chemical or any mix of chemicals that has the purpose of either repelling, mitigating, destroying, or in any other way negatively affecting an organism that we deem a pest. That's a pretty broad definition. That's going to include herbicides. That's going to include insecticides, fungicides, miticides. All of these fit into that overall category of a pesticide. Now, when Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring in 1962, she was identifying an issue with pesticides. And after that book was published, we kept increasing our amount of pesticide use. So it didn't level off for quite a while. Around the 1980s, it actually dropped a little bit. We started getting more regulations in the 70s. We'll talk about those later. And since then, it's fairly well stabilized. So we don't necessarily use more pesticides, but we're finding new types of pesticides. Pesticides work in a variety of ways, and I'm just going to cover some of the major ways for you today. <coughs> Most pesticides work by interfering with the nervous system of the species they're attacking in some way. So either they try to keep nerves from passing information along that nervous system, they might try to interrupt messages from one nerve to another, they might try to interrupt messages as they travel from a nerve into a muscle. But in any case, they're interrupting the flow of information. We have some that are going to interfere with an organism's metabolism on a cellular level. They actually disrupt things. And then some that can disrupt the function at an organ level. So I'm just going to give you a quick intro to the nervous system. I know for a lot of you it's probably been a while since you've had biology class. So it's what I do every day, so I've always had biology class. But we're going to talk about what a nerve looks like. So this is an example of a typical nerve. This is its nerve body, and then it has this long tail called an axon, and that's what information needs to travel down. It's normally traveling as a series of electrical impulses, but one nerve doesn't run the length of your entire body, or the length of an insect body. Usually it has to get to another nerve. And when that happens, there's a gap between those two nerves. So here we're looking at what's called a presynaptic terminal. That's one end of the nerve. The message needs to get across that gap and over here to this postsynaptic terminal. Sometimes this is a gap between two nerves. Other times this would be a gap between a nerve and whatever it's trying to send that message to, whether it's a muscle, some kind of an organ, whatever it's actually. So our first major mode of action for pesticides is that they work as a sodium blocker. So when those messages are traveling down the nerves, they do so through what's called an action potential. It actually looks like those little sine waves you see from the heartbeat when they're showing those in the hospital or on TV. So it sends that message down. And part of what's required for that message to transmit is that they require this element. They require sodium to move in and out of the nerve to help transmit that message. So what these pesticides do is they block that sodium from moving in or out of the cell. So they essentially stop transmission of the message. You can have as many messages as you like. They're never going to move down along the nerve. 
So two types that we have that are sodium blockers are organochlorines. These are synthetic pesticides. The most famous example of this is DDT, which is banned in the United States, but is still used in other parts of the world. It is very, very lipophilic. That means if something ingests this DDT, it tends to build up in their fatty tissues in their body and it stays there. You don't excrete this, you don't get rid of this, it just keeps building up in your body. <laughs> and it's very environmentally persistent. So once it gets out into the soil, into waters, into organisms, it sticks around. It doesn't break down. Or I should say that, it does break down, but what it breaks down to is more toxic than the actual DDT itself. So we don't really want it to break down. Our other group that are sodium blockers are the pyrethroids. Now these are synthetic, but they're actually based on a botanical substance that was derived from chrysanthemums. So they are also very lipophilic. They're going to build up in tissues, they're going to stay inside organisms. But the good news is if these get out into the environment, they break down and degrade pretty quickly. So they're not as much of a concern over a long time frame. As long as you don't ingest them, you should be all right. All right, our next group of pesticides work by inhibiting a substance called acetylchlorine esterase, or ACHE. So we'll go through how that works. So here's that presynaptic neuron I told you about, and here's the postsynaptic. So a message is coming here, it needs to get across to this other neuron. So at nerve synapses, organisms do this by releasing a chemical called a neurotransmitter. And that neurotransmitter can essentially be released from this neuron, it can travel across that gap, down to this neuron, and it can pass that message along, which is just serving as our messenger. The most common of these neurotransmitters is what's called acetylcholine, or ACH. <coughs> so here's our neurotransmitter. It's in that presynaptic neuron. It needs to get down to the postsynaptic neuron. So it's going to move down. It's going to get to the edge. It's going to release that neurotransmitter out of the gap. The neurotransmitter comes across and binds to these receptor molecules. Once they bind, they effectively pass that message on and it starts traveling down the next neuron. Now, nerves don't want a message to send forever. At some point, you want to stop talking. So when that happens, they release a substance called acetylcholine esterase. That goes through and breaks down all of that extra acetylcholine. So if there's any messenger still floating around out in the gap, this goes through and eats all those up and makes sure the message stops being sent. So that's, that's just stopping the message transmit. So that's important. If you're thinking about a message that's telling a muscle to contract. If you're walking, your nerves are telling your muscles to contract, to move, but at some point you want them to stop contracting. You don't want your muscles to be in full spasm all the time. So you need to stop message transmission. So what an ACAG inhibitor does basically is prevents the cell from making that ACAG. So now there's nobody to stop the message. In this case, in insects, this basically causes unstoppable muscle spasms. So their muscles just keep contracting nonstop. Eventually, they die because of that. So they burn through all their energy. They can't function. They just go into full body spasms and die. <laughs> all right. Our two main groups of pesticides that fit into this category are the organophosphates and the carbamates. These are relatively short-lived in the environment. They can last anywhere from a few days to several months, so they tend to break down relatively quickly. They don't bioaccumulate, so they don't tend to build up inside tissues, so that's relatively good. But they can be really toxic if they get ingested by an unintended organism. So I always put seven up here. This one's really common. Lots of people use this on their gardens. Go out and shake it all over your crops. Like when I was a kid, this is what my parents used. I definitely got this stuff on myself. But that ACHE, that neurotransmitter, that's the same thing that we use. We use the same neurotransmitters, we use the same enzymes to break those down. So in the right amounts, this could interfere with our nervous system just like it could interfere with the insects. So if the wrong organism ingests this and it ingests it in a sufficient amount, it can have pretty negative effects. Birds and aquatic organisms tend to be the most strongly affected by this. So even if they eat something that has this on their surface, if they eat an insect that's ingested this, it can poison that next order of insect or animal. And we know that this does cause human health issues, or this does cause issues in terms of human health. So there are people that have pesticide toxicity every year, and the vast majority of them are people that have gone out and gotten this stuff all over themselves. They didn't clean up, their kids put it in their mouths, things like that. One that works slightly differently, but that's pretty important in today's modern age, are ones that are ACH minutes. Now, if you remember I said ACH, that's that messenger molecule, that's the one traveling between those. 
So what this pesticide does is it actually comes in and binds to these receptor sites. It looks just like an ACH molecule. It binds to those and it prevents the right neurotransmitter from binding. So it just blocks the message in a slightly different way. So if it can block that neurotransmitter from binding, they can send as much neurotransmitter as they want. No messages are getting into this postsynaptic neuron because it's been blocked by the pesticide. So same idea, no messages get transmitted. Rather than having a message transmitted all the time, nothing gets through. Generally, you have paralysis and death as a result. The reason I bring these up is because historically, these were our nicotinoid that's our nicotinoid pesticides, and now these are our neonicotinoid pesticides. These are how they tend to act on the nervous system. All right, now I said not everything's nervous system based. Some affects a cell, some affects an organ. So things like rotenone, that's used a lot more in terms of aquatic species than it is on terrestrial, but occasionally we see it used as an insecticide. This one actually interferes with the mitochondria inside the cells of the organism. So the mitochondria is the organism that burns sugar. It breaks down glucose and it releases the energy that's there. If cells don't have mitochondria, they don't have energy and they die. So if organisms can't break down their glucose, they can't get any energy, essentially the cell starves to death, and if enough cells starve to death, the organism's going to die too. We know that this one is very toxic to humans. If there's large doses of this, animals or other humans can suffer pretty severe poisoning. And more recently, this has been linked to the development of Parkinson's disease. So people that use this a lot, farmers, people in the agricultural industry that use rotenone a lot in younger years are showing up with more and more incidences of Parkinson's disease. <coughs> and then finally, our BT, the Bacillus thuringiensis, thur thuringiensis. I struggle with that one. This can actually disrupt an organism at an organ level. So here we're talking about a bacterial spore, and it's packaged together with a protein crystal. When insects ingest this, they have an alkaline stomach. So that's different than ours. We actually have an acidic stomach. Our pH is really low, so basically stomach acid. So these insects have an alkaline stomach. That activates this particular substance, it activates this protein crystal, and it prevents the stomach from being protected from its own digestive fluids. So the stomach basically eats a hole in itself. The stomach acid, the stomach alkalines here in our insects, they eat a hole in the stomach wall. At that point, both the stomach contents and those bacterial spores can get out into the main body of the organism and start wreaking havoc there. The good news is this is non-toxic to humans, to birds, and other mammals because our stomachs are acidic, so if we ingest this, it just deactivates that bacteria and we pass it out of our bodies. This is kind of, there's nothing that's totally safe in terms of pesticides, but this seems to be the, less, the least harmful to humans. And the good news about BT is there are different varieties of this, different bacterial varieties that you can match to different pests. So this is the first pesticide we have that can actually be somewhat specific. We can pick the species we want to kill, we can apply this type of pesticide, and it won't kill everything else in the area. So typically this is not going to harm our beneficial insects if you choose the appropriate type of Bt. And Bt is also the one that's commonly in our GMO crop. So typically you're inserting a gene into the crop and it makes that crop start producing its own toxin that can kill pests. So generally, in that case, they're inserting a gene for a type of BT that will kill the pests that typically prey on that specific crop. <clears throat> All right, so now we know what pesticides are and we know how they work. Let's talk about historically how they've been regulated and how we've gotten to where we are today. So before the 1950s, there wasn't much of anything done with pesticides. The first thing that actually came out was the Federal Insecticide Act in 1910. This wasn't actually concerned about any effects of using pesticides. Instead, this was an attempt to try to keep farmers protected from pesticide manufacturers making fraudulent claims. So they had to be honest in what their pesticides might actually do. In 1947, we had our first real major piece of legislation. This was the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. It was a bit of a mouthful, so we just call this one FIFRA. This one was a joint effort between the chemical industry, specifically pesticide manufacturers, the federal government, the United States Department of Agriculture, and this was also not intended as any kind of regulatory legislation. 
This was an attempt to make sure that pesticides were labeled appropriately, that if farmers got something that wasn't as effective as they said it was, that they had some kind of recourse to, to go to the pesticide manufacturer. <coughs> it's important to note, though, the people coming up with this bill were the pesticide manufacturers and the United States Department of Agriculture, who obviously wanted to promote agricultural output. They weren't too concerned about the effects of pesticides as much as they were about using pesticides and increasing our crop yields. Most of the public at this point in time wasn't concerned about pesticides either. So this was really just something to try to regulate the process rather than the effects. In the 1950s are when we started to find our first concerns about the potential effects of pesticides in regards to human health. So there were several hearings held in the House of Representatives, 1950, 1951, and they resulted in a new agency in the Food and Drug Administration getting involved in pesticide regulation. So what we started to realize was if we're spraying these pesticides all over our crops and then we're eating those crops, we're ingesting those pesticides potentially. So the Food and Drug Administration got involved. They were able to push through what was called the Pesticide Control Amendment in 1954, which just said that if your food has pesticides on it, there's a limit to how many residues can remain on that food by the time it gets to market. So if you sprayed your apples with a bunch of pesticides, they have to be washed or something has to happen to them before you send them to the store, assuming that people are just gonna eat those directly. And this also gave the FDA the authority to ban a pesticide if they said it would be unsafe if sprayed directly on food. So it provided a tiny bit of regulation there. If they said this is gonna have huge effects on human health when we spray it on food, then they say you can't use that one anymore. Now we get into the 1960s, and this is where Silent Spring was published. This is where that environmental movement really starts to kick off. So in 1962, Rachel Carson wrote this series of essays for The New Yorker. All of them essentially had the same theme, which was we're using a lot of pesticides, and we don't understand what those pesticides necessarily do. And she argued that not only were we using them inappropriately, but that we were already seeing the negative effects of these pesticides. That there were severe environmental effects and severe effects on human health as a result of these pesticides. She got attacked across the board, mainly by pesticide manufacturers who said she didn't have any background in this area, she didn't know what she was talking about, she didn't have any right to try to publish this information. Unfortunately for them, there were multiple federal agencies always look, are also looking into this, and all of them corroborated her findings. So the Public Health Service said, yep, they're affecting humans. Fish and Wildlife Service said, yes, they're affecting other organisms. Even the President's Science Advisory Council said, yes, something's going on. So they turned this into the book, and the Silent Spring has said, this is what really started getting people to understand what was happening all around. <coughs> So did Silent Spring matter? It did eventually lead to the banning of all of the pesticides that she discussed in that book. Now, all six of those were organochlorines. They were all in one specific family, but all of them were eventually banned. However, it's important to remember, she didn't argue for a ban. She didn't request that they be banned. She just said, we need to use these pesticides responsibly, and we need to understand the potential effects of them. Anytime we're spraying something out there that we might ingest that might be on our food, we should know what it is. So we need to just be responsible and knowledgeable. So after the publishing of Silent Spring, there were actually a lot of different proposals that were made to try to, to reform FIFRA, that Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Resenticide Act. None of them got enough congressional support to pass. We see the same thing happen all the time. It takes a lot to get something through Congress. So none of these passed. The only thing that really happened here was that they took that authority of FIFRA, they took it away from the Department of Agriculture, and they moved it into the FDA form. <coughs> they also said that they needed better public access to that pesticide registry data. So they wanted to actually let people see what was going on with pesticides. And they said if we do have multiple agencies working on these processes, working on what's going on, they need to be talking to each other. So the Fish and Wildlife Service needs to be talking to the Public Health Department. Everybody needs to be sharing information so that we really know what's going on. So in 1964, they did get one amendment through to FIFRA. The only thing that happened here was it allowed the USDA to suspend or cancel a pesticides registration if they deemed it an imminent health hazard. So if ingesting this was gonna kill somebody where they stood, we should probably not use that pesticide. Nothing really got banned at this point. It just said we could potentially ban it. 
1970s are where the environmental movement really took off. So in 1970, the Environmental Protection Agency was created. Now, you can say you love or hate the EPA, that's fine. They have lots of views on lots of different issues, but this is the first time we actually had an agency created that was independent of any sort of economic, agricultural, whatever output. It was just trying to look at environmental effects. So the regulation of pesticides got transferred over from USDA, FDA, fully to the EPA. So we had one agency that should be regulating pesticides that potentially would not have any bias about using pesticides. So they amended FIFRA in 1972 with FEPCA, the Federal Environmental Pesticides Control Act. This is the first time that pesticide manufacturers actually had to provide some kind of evidence about what their pesticide would do. So pesticide manufacturers had to perform tests on any new pesticide they developed to ensure that it would not have unreasonable adverse health effects on humans or on the environment. So they actually had to back themselves up a little bit. And any pesticide that was already registered had to be re-registered with these new requirements. So if something was already in the system, they had to go back and perform tests and make sure it was actually safe to use. The EPA then had authority to refuse registration to any single pesticide, if here's where it gets tricky, if they concluded it had risks to humans, wildlife, or the environment that outweighed the benefits provided by that pesticide. So it's not saying that they ban them if they have risks. It's only if we decided those risks were greater than the potential benefits of using that pesticide. So again, not much happened there because somebody has to draw that line of how much risk is too much risk. How much benefit is enough benefit. But the good news was any of those test results had to be made available to the public. The bad news was this act provided some further restrictions to the EPA. So if a pesticide was selected to be banned by the EPA, the EPA was on the hook to compensate the pesticide manufacturers, distributors, and users for any value of any unused pesticide that they possessed. And there was no budget for that. The EPA didn't have an independent budget there. So they essentially said, you guys can ban whatever you want to, but it's going to cost you a lot of money and we're not giving you any money. So this effectively tied the hands of the EPA from banning anything at all. This is called the FEPCA Indemnity Clause. <coughs> it shows you the power of government and how we think something happens, but it doesn't. So 1980s, not much happened until the end of the 1980s. In 1988, there was an amendment that required the re-registration of over 600 active ingredients used in pesticides, and it required the pesticide manufacturers to start paying for this process. So they said, if you want to use these ingredients, you have to prove that they are safe. And more importantly, this repealed that indemnity clause to the EPA. So now they said payments are still going to have to be made, but they set up a funding account separate from the EPA. They were coming straight out of the U.S. Treasury instead. So now the EPA actually had the freedom to ban something if they wanted to because they knew they weren't going to have to pay for what was banned. In the 90s, we started to really understand effects of pesticides, not just on overall human health, but specifically in children. So a report came out called the, or entitled The Pesticides in the Diets of Infants and Children, which made three pretty important recommendations. So first off, it said, EPA, you need to stop using this cost-benefit analysis. If there is any risk at all to human health, particularly in infants and children, you need to stop using that pesticide. So we don't decide that, you know, having five kids die is okay as long as we increase crop yields. There's no risk. That's an acceptable amount of risk. <clears throat> they also recommended that the EPA start conducting additional studies that look specifically at infants and children because they said there's different stuff happening. When children are developing, when infants are developing, their biochemistry, their internal physiology, everything is different than it is in adults. And so a pesticide that doesn't affect an adult might have really severe effects on development of children. So they said, you need to expand the types of tests you're doing. And finally, they said, you need to start thinking about cases in which someone is using multiple pesticides at the same time that have the same mode of action. Because if you're using more of these simultaneously, those effects are gonna build up. Even if you're using ones that have different modes of action, you're going to see greater effects, potentially, on it, all the organisms in the area. And then finally, we get to our 2000s here. We don't have any major groundbreaking stuff. 
We're now working under what's called the Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, or PREA. So in 2004, PREA 1 passed. This just set up a service fee system for our pesticides. It did establish some funding for worker protection activities. So we started to recognize people that worked with these pesticides on a regular basis probably needed to be trained how to use them safely. So for farm workers, they set up training programs on how to apply pesticides, how to be safe, what protective gear to use. And they also started providing training for healthcare providers, especially in areas that were hybridly dominated by agriculture, so that they could recognize the signs and symptoms of pesticides poisoning. So if someone came in, they could get the appropriate treatment for them. This has basically just been maintained. It usually runs on a five-year cycle. So a PREA 2 passed in 2007, PREA 3 in 2012. They just maintained all the funding that was there. In 2012, they actually established a program called the Pesticide Environmental Stewardship Program, which focuses on integrated pest management, which I know a lot of us are familiar with in here, but essentially trying to support projects that would reduce pesticide use by looking at other types of biocontrol methods of pests. So PREA 3, again, was on that five-year cycle. It was set to expire in 2017. It got extended in continuing resolutions until February 15th of 2019. I don't know if you guys remember, but last January, February, the whole government was shut down over spending bills that couldn't be passed. So they did pass a spending bill finally in February. They forgot to put anything in there about PREA, so there was no reauthorization for that at all. Luckily, somebody was actually on their game at this point. They recognized it pretty quickly. They wrote a separate bill. They got it pushed through Congress and that PREA 4 passed in March of 2019, maintaining all of our current funding, all of our current regulations for pesticides. But there was a window there where nobody was really sure what was gonna happen. I like to use this because it shows that every now and then Congress can recognize a problem and work on it quickly and get something done. It can be a frustrating time in general, but here's one time where I think they might've got it right. So our current pesticide regulation <laughs> says that any pesticide that is distributed, sold, or used in the United States has to be registered with the EPA. And that registration process looks at several different things. So it's gonna look at what active ingredients are in the pesticide and what we know about them. It's gonna specifically look at the site that it's being used on, the crop that it's being used on, how often it can be used, how much is used, the timing of the use. So is this something that's applied in the spring or something that's applied in the fall? how you're gonna store that pesticide, how you're gonna dispose of the pesticide, and finally, any human health or environmental effects associated with the use of that pesticide. So all of these things are now considered when deciding whether or not to register a pesticide. If a company has developed a pesticide and they want to register it, they have to conduct tests on that pesticide, they have to provide all the data from those tests according to EPA guidelines. So they have to carry out different types of toxicity tests. They have to do a cue test, which essentially say, what's gonna happen in the short term? If this pesticide is applied in the amounts that we're proposing, what's gonna happen to organisms in kind of a 24 to 96 hour window? We're basically looking for any kind of lethal effects here. They also have to do chronic tests, where we look at what's gonna happen if this pesticide builds up in an organism. If you apply this every single month for two years, is there gonna be a toxic effect? So we would call those a chronic test, those are usually anywhere from a month to two years in length. In general, these tests are trying to evaluate if that pesticide has the potential to have adverse effects on either humans, wildlife, fish, or plants in the area. Now, there were some issues with these tests. Originally, there were some, um, or there were some pretty biased labs that were doing the tests, so people were getting falsified results. That's mostly been cleared up by now, but that is always a problem. The tests aren't just looking at effects on living organisms, they also look at the potential for these pesticides to get out into the environment. So they say, what are the chances these are gonna end up in our streams or in our rivers? What are the chances these are in our groundwater? What are the chances they're gonna show up in our drinking water? What's the likelihood they're gonna stick around in the soils? Or if we're spraying them in the air, are they gonna drift off somewhere else and kill everything in the field next to them? So they said, we need to actually start looking at environmental effects as well. So they did a study where they just went out, they looked at 48 different streams, <laughs> I apologize again, across the country. They looked at them in agricultural areas, urban areas, undeveloped areas, and then ones where there were kind of a mix of uses. So around here, we'd kind of be in that mixed use area. We've got a little urban, agricultural, whatever. 
and they looked in the stream water, so surface waters, they also looked in groundwater, so what you'd be pulling up for your wells or maybe irrigating crops. So in agricultural areas, they found pesticides in 97% of the streams that they tested, and they found it in 61% of the groundwater that they tested. So these pesticides aren't just staying on the crops, they're getting into the water. In urban areas, about 97% in the surface waters, 55-ish percent, so still pretty high in our groundwaters. Undeveloped areas had our best result. Only 65% of the streams had pesticides in them, and 29% of the groundwater. And in our mixed uses, we're back up to those 90% being in the stream water. So across the nation, it seems like pesticides are getting into the water pretty easily. <laughs> the overall registration process is not an easy process. Conducting all those tests takes time, and it's expensive. So it takes a minimum of six to nine years to get a new pesticide registered, and it costs millions of dollars to go through this process. But this has not slowed pesticide manufacturers down at all. There's a lot of money to be made from pesticides. It's worth this cost. So any pesticide that actually makes it through this registration process still has to be reevaluated every 15 years to make sure we haven't learned something new about that pesticide. Now the EPA has a loophole here. Even if something isn't registered, they do have the authority to allow the usage of an unregistered pesticide if there is some local need or some dire emergency, as they put it. <laughs> so if there's a pest species that's affecting mass amounts of crops and they think it's gonna be a pretty severe economic threat, they can allow the use of an unregistered pesticide. If there is risk to another species, an endangered or threatened species from a pest species, they can use that pesticide. If there's a new pest that's been introduced, which happens a lot with invasive species, we can use these pesticides to try to control it. Or if we need to control a pest because it has a serious harmful effect on human health. Let's say we've got mosquitoes that are transmitting West Nile virus, so they use a pesticide to control the mosquitoes because they're concerned about human health effects of the disease they transmit. Basically, it says, if you guys want to use a pesticide that hasn't been registered, figure out a reason why you need to use that pesticide, and the EPA can grant you authority to use that pesticide. We're going to come back to that in a few more slides. All right, we can't do any talk about pesticides without talking about neonicotinoids, especially to a crowd of beekeepers, so I'm going to briefly introduce some of the data on neonicotinoids. These were introduced in Europe in the 1990s. They were kind of ahead of what the usage was here. They were considered to be safe, some of the safest of the pesticides that are out there. They don't really affect human health at all. And in terms of bees, they said they're only toxic to bees at pretty high doses. So around 50 parts per billion a bee would have to ingest in order to kill that bee. They were taking these pesticides and putting them on plant roots. They were coating seeds with them. They said the chances that any of this pesticide getting up into the nectar, getting up into the pollen, is incredibly small. The amounts that are going to get there, if any, aren't going to be near, near that toxic level. So everything should be good. But almost immediately after they started applying these neonicotinoids to crops, specifically sunflowers, we started seeing bee populations crash in France. It's always a chance, it's unrelated, but it seemed like it happened right after this. So, now remember I said there's two types of studies, acute and chronic. So the acute studies said the bees should be fine, but those chronic tests can take up to two years. So they already started using these before all the data was in on the chronic tests. So subsequent chronic toxicity studies showed that at doses as low as six parts per billion, even though it didn't kill the bees, it started affecting them. So it affected their behavior, it disrupted their foraging. Essentially, they got lost. When they flew out of the hive, they didn't know how to find their way back to the hive. And they started testing the pollen and nectar and said they regularly have concentrations of five to 10 parts per billion. So it's true that they shouldn't kill the bees, but it definitely seemed like it confused the bees and the amounts that could affect the bees were getting into the nectar and the pollen. It was also showing up in the water that the bees were drinking. So all the surface waters nearby that the bees were going to had these pesticides in them as well and often at much higher concentrations than were in the nectar or in the pollen. <sighs> In Europe, these have been studied extensively. Over 1,500 published studies to date that concern neonicotinoid pesticides. We know that they interfere with the bees' memories and their homing abilities. 
So it seems like once a bee gets out of the hive and goes out to forage, they don't know how to get back home. We know that in male bees, this reduces their overall sperm count. So it reduces the sperm count to drones, which makes it less likely that they're going to be able to reproduce. It's going to reduce the total population size. And it actually now, newest research shows that the bees can get addicted to these pesticides. They like the taste of the neonicotinoids. So they will preferentially consume nectar that has pesticides in it rather than clean nectar. Kind of makes sense if you think neonicotinoids, they're based on nicotine. A lot of people get addicted to nicotine as well. Similar pathways in there, neurotransmitters. <coughs> Outside of just our pollinators, we've been found that they reduce the predatory insects that tend to prey on agricultural pests. So they're actually killing off other types of beneficial insects. And in general, using these pesticides does not increase crop yields. They also have negative effects on aquatic insects. They get into water very, very easily. So there's effects on fish, there's effects on other aquatic organisms. And if a bird eats something that has this pesticide, we've also seen them reduce bird populations as a result of eating insects treated with neonicotinoids. In the European Union, they did a partial ban on neonicotinoids in 2013. They said, we're going to ban usage of the top three pesticides for outdoor flowering crops that we know are used heavily by bees. So they're just kind of doing a trial run with it. And then in 2018, they did a total EU ban on these three leading neonicotinoid pesticides. Now, it's only banned for outdoor crops. They're still allowed to use these in greenhouse settings, so in interior settings where they think they're not going to get out of the general environment. France went a step farther. They actually banned all five of the top neonicotinoid pesticides for both outdoor and greenhouse use. So they have the most restrictive policies about pesticides anywhere in the world right now. And whether or not it's related or not, when they stopped see using neonicotinoids, their bee populations did seem to bounce back. In the United States, we still use these pesticides widely, and we're upping the usage every single year of these pesticides. So here's different types of crops that we are using them on. And these are the amounts of neonicotinoids. You can see it's really been going up steeply. <coughs> Almost all of the corn and cotton that gets planted every single year and about half of the soybeans are treated with these neonicotinoid pesticides. So on an industrial agricultural scale, these are being used heavily. Something that makes these a little different than some of our other pesticides is these dissolve really easily in water. So that means if you have a seed that has this coating on it and the ground gets wet, it rains, there's any kind of moisture, that coating can dissolve off of the seed, it can get out into the soil, it can travel in water out to streams, it gets into groundwaters, and if other plants take up that water from the soil, let's say you've planted some wildflowers next to a field, they can pull that pesticide up into their system as well. So even plants that weren't treated with these can be affected by them. <coughs> so in 2012 to 2014, they sampled streams across the United States, and they found that in around 70% of the streams they sampled, they had neonicotinoids in the water. So these are definitely getting out into the environment. Most commonly, we're looking at streams that are in agricultural areas or urban areas where people are applying a lot of pesticides. Undeveloped areas weren't as heavily hit. So in the U.S., we have restricted the use of neonicotinoids slightly by the EPA, but nothing compared to what's happened in Europe. So we have changed labeling requirements for neonicotinoid pesticides to indicate that you shouldn't use them while bees are actively foraging because there's potential for them to have effects on bees. So we've got here just kind of a sample label that says, don't use this of insects or pollinating plants. We all know insects pollinate plants year-round, so this says you can't use pesticides pretty much any time during the growing season. No new neonicotinoids are being approved until they complete risk assessments on them. That restriction was put in place in 2015. These risk assessments are scheduled to be completed by the end of 2019. It was supposed to be the 20th of 2018 and the end of 2017, so it just keeps getting pushed back. We're not really sure when they'll actually be done. And every single one of the pesticides that are under review currently have been approved for emergency use. As recently as 2016, three of them have been approved in 2019 for emergency use. So even though we said we don't know if they're safe or not and we're not supposed to be using them, we're still using them. 
So in 2017, we did have a little bit more restriction here. They specifically said neonicotinoid pesticides can't be applied to crops that are in flower while honeybees are under contracts to provide pollination services. That's also fairly restrictive. This doesn't protect any kind of native pollinator species. It's only focused on honeybees. It doesn't protect plants anytime that they are not flowering. And it doesn't protect any honeybees that are not under contract for commercial pollination. The vast majority of beekeepers in this room, I guess, are not commercial beekeepers. We're not hauling bees out to California to pollinate the almond crop. This doesn't do anything to protect our bees. Now, a preliminary assessment that was conducted in 2017 by the EPA said that yes, neonicotinoid pesticides do have a negative effect on bees. They do have a negative effect on wildlife, but we're still gonna use them. So the usage was not restricted any farther, and in fact, there have been several proposals considered to increase the usage of them. And in one of the more recent bits of legislation on this, in 2018, there had been a ban saying that in wildlife refuges, we're not gonna spray neonicotinoid pesticides. That got reversed by an executive order, so now we are allowed to spray these in wildlife refuges. Some states have basically said, we're tired of the federal government's efforts here, we're gonna restrict them. So a few states have started banning or restricting neonicotinoid use. California and Minnesota have both restricted use of these pesticides. Maryland and Connecticut have banned the use of these pesticides. So where does this leave us today? What's the future of our pesticide use? We've got to remember, just like Carson said, usage of pesticides is not going to go away. Completely banning every pesticide out there is unrealistic. It can't happen. We cannot support our agricultural system without at least using some pesticides some of the time. And we can't feed the projected world population unless we can increase our agricultural output. Not just keep it where it's at, but we need it to be better. So pesticides are going to be used. Pesticides have to be used if we don't want a lot of people to starve. But we're seeing more of a push now to look at things like integrated pest management. To look at using those pesticides responsibly, using them in limited ways, and trying to use natural biocontrol methods as well. So trying to reduce our use of pesticides by looking for natural insect predators or insect pests, by promoting species in the area that might actually help. Essentially, Rachel Carson had it right back there in 1962. I agree with her still. We're gonna have to use pesticides, but she said we need to use them responsibly, we need to use them in a limited fashion, and we need to understand the effects that they're gonna have on humans and on the environment. There are gonna be some negative things out there. There is no perfect solution. But she said, we don't need to ban them, we just need to know what we are doing, and I think that's right. So we need to look at all the data that regards effects of pesticide use. We need to critically examine that data, and we need to make decisions that are both ecologically sound and economically sound. There's always gonna be a balance between economy and ecology. Nobody can ever win totally. So we just need to be smart about what we're doing. Oops, I went backwards there, sorry. And with that, I will take any questions. I've got just about 10 minutes or so. Sorry. Okay, questions? Um, my question is about the neonic <coughs> employees, but. Um, you said in your presentation that they have not been found to be effective for agricultural use. Correct. Then why are we using them? They kill a lot of insects. They do. So they do kill a lot of insects, so they will kill pest insects. But it seems like even if they kill those pests, it doesn't improve the overall crop yield. Right. So what's the point? That's an excellent question. <laughs> Somebody out there makes a lot of money selling those pesticides. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, but they—I mean—they can be useful if they're controlling things like mosquitoes for trying to control human health effects. So there might be other applications, but it seems like agriculturally, it doesn't make that much sense to use them. But in terms of the pesticides I talked about, they have the lowest effects on human health, and so a lot of times they say if we're going to use a pesticide. If we have to use something, we certainly don't want to poison people. We're okay with poisoning something else, but we definitely don't want to poison people. Yes. I have a question. Um, 
regardless of the pesticides that you know is getting into the water, mm -hmm. uh, I assume that our water treatment that's <coughs> eliminating that, or at least to a, a so, so the question was, if the pesticides are getting into the water, doesn't our water treatment plant take care of that? The answer is no. For the most part, they do not. Most of our water treatment systems in the United States were put into place back in the 50s or 60s. It was before a lot of these pesticides were even out there. They don't have any way to treat for this. We are trying to retrofit some of them, but it's a pretty expensive process. So for the most part, if it's in the water, and the same thing goes with pharmaceutical compounds that get in the water, Treatment systems aren't designed to take those out of the water. They're coming right out in your drinking water most of the time. Is it, have they leaked that to the amount of cancer we have? In there's there's a lot of studies in terms of correlation. There's so many other things that also correlate with cancer increases. It is hard to really pinpoint and say this one thing is any kind of an effect. But there are lots of studies that say there's a good chance that having this being part of our general diet is not good. <laughs> Yes. Good, bad, and different? My personal feeling is if we've got to use something, it's the best option. There are some negatives with it as well, but there certainly doesn't seem to be as negative effects with synthetic pesticides or with neonicotinoids, things like that. So if I have to pick a pesticide to use, my preference would be for the BT, but there's a lot of people out there that still disagree and say we shouldn't be using anything at all. With the BT, people tend to get more upset when we talk about GMO plants that have the BT gene inserted because people are really nervous about GMO crops in general. But a lot of times the BT isn't GMO. I mean, it is just something you can put on your actual plants. And that doesn't seem to be as scary to people as inserting a gene that makes the plant make its own BT. Um, kind of more geared towards using the BT as a spray on our cones mm -hmm. or the wax cones. I, I can't speak to that necessarily. My background is more with the agricultural side of it because I'm new, relatively new to beekeeping. But if you have to use something, I would think that would be a better option. But I don't want to tell you to go use it. Well, there are uh, options, you know, for combating wax moths mm -hmm. in a natural way. Um, I'm not using anything. But I, I guess my biggest question is what I mean is BT on our It's safe for us to obviously spray and then we're uh, ingesting the honey. Yes, because the BT won't affect humans because our stomachs are totally different. But what about the bees? The bees. Usually, the varieties of BT can be targeted to a specific pest. So, my guess is if they have one that they've told you is safe to use on comb, that it's one that they know won't affect bees. But again, that is not. An area that I feel comfortable saying okay. it's absolutely okay. But, yeah, does anyone else know specifically about what type of BT? The BT that used to be on a product called Sertan, I don't know if yeah. it's still there or not. It, it, yeah. it, was, it was targeted toward Lepidoptera, which is the. With the moss and butterflies. Not Hymenoptera. Right. So it was where they used one of those targeted varieties, so it should be safe. And that's one of the benefits of BT is that it can be a little bit more insect specific. A lot of our pesticides are broad spectrum, so they're going to kill good and bad. I have a lot of different BTs. Yeah. Lots. <coughs> and people, you know, they find an order that from whoever, Amazon, and they make, oh, here's, you know, here's a BT, BT, I'll just, you know, pick out that Whichever one. Whichever one I want. Yeah, but that's not the case. You've got to be specific. <coughs> I think the, the thing about black moth though is, is having a very healthy colony. You don't usually have the black moth problem so much of a problem unless your colony is having other issues. Well, I'm talking about the colds that you store. But I mean, you could do a seal to make nothing. Um, seal or freeze. Yeah. Not necessarily. That's just going to promote. Like freezing, freezing foam. Well, how are you going to freeze 2,000 supers? <laughs> One at a time. Uh, <laughs> How big is your freezer? That's the question. Yeah. You want to store your will just for ice storage, right? Yeah, right. How do you feel about taking your supers to the North Pole? Yeah. <laughs> so apparently that is done. It's Um, a whole different can of worms you didn't touch on, but there's a lot of towns that fog for mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. How does that affect 
It depends on the specific pesticide that's being used again with the fogging. Um, most of those are at least designed to be safe for human health. And generally, my understanding is that they're trying to do things that are a little bit more specific to the mosquitoes, so it's not going to affect everything else in the area. But most pesticides are broad spectrum. So I was reading that a lot of them are the chrysanthemum based. Mm -hmm. The pyrethroids? Yeah. Product. So that is more specific to the mosquito or? You can. <laughs> so he said that have a short kill life. So basically, they're very, they don't persist in the environment really, really for a long time. So the idea is they're going to kill something and be gone right away. So they're not going to stick around in order for bees to ingest them or things like that. A lot of times you see those foggers too. They're going out, they're spraying at night. So they're trying to do that at times when you don't have insects actively foraging. They're trying to minimize some of those risks. Uh -huh. Yeah. I went, I went through it. The foggers were out every night. <laughs> That's how short the life is. Do they address the environment when you guys are in the balance of days? Do they wipe out all the insects? Or do we might create an imbalance that could be one of the so that's a tricky question. Yes. <laughs> yes, there is a lot, even if you look at their website, that says, you know, we're really concerned about the effects on pollinators. They're funding for different things that are out there. But what you always have to remember is the EPA is still a government-appointed agency. The head of the EPA is an appointed position by whatever political administration is in charge at the time. So a lot of that is going to come down to actual political, part or political partisan type things. So it's, it's tough in an agency that size to really have a targeted focus and have a message that's consistent. So currently the EPA is relaxing a lot of restrictions and a lot of regulations, but that's not to say that that's not going to flip flop around in the future too. That's, that seems to make sense, but some people seem to want to go a different route. <laughs> it does, it does. And a lot of people don't realize that, that the head of the EPA and the goals of the EPA are very much politically motivated. It is not an independent organization. So in our previous administration, we actually had a lot of tightening of restrictions, and now we're seeing, now we're seeing a loosening of a lot of restrictions. That's an interesting question. So when you cross state lines, you get into a lot of issues. Now, my background with this is more in water quality, but I know there are issues where one state has sued another state because one state's problem drifted down into another state. So the one that was big a few years ago was the state of Oklahoma sued the state of Arkansas because Arkansas chicken producers were producing lots of fertilizers that were getting into waterways that were going into Oklahoma, and Oklahoma was having to pay to clean them up. And so Oklahoma said, well, Arkansas is creating a problem. So they sued Arkansas and said they had to pay them. So there are cases when you cross state boundaries where states will try to sue one another to get that financial compensation. It's better if we can try to work together, but, but it has gone to court several times. Is, it, is there like agricultural entities that regulate if there's misuse or risk of the chemicals? How's that work? Because like, I just saw a case of this last week or whatever, I think it was something that drifted into Arkansas from Missouri. I was going to say, generally with drift, we're talking about pretty, it's not going to drift a huge distance, so the only areas right on the border that are going to be affected. So there are local and state court systems, there's agencies that can deal with that, but it's a pretty limited problem when we're talking about spray drift. It's a bigger problem across state lines when we're talking about connecting waterways. All right, I think my time is up, so. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, because he's over there trying to get his top loaded right now. So <coughs> Don Beisel is a member of the Joplin Area Beekeepers Association, and he's going to talk to us today about survivor bees and whether that's a real thing or not. So, uh, I'm going to step out of the room for a few minutes, but if you guys have further questions for me, I'll be around for the rest of the day. So feel free to grab me lunch. Thank you.